So today we have a case out of the Fifth Circuit, and I think this case is going to show us that asylum is hard, that you can have so many things go your way. You can have a judge who finds you credible, you can have a court that finds all of the facts sympathetic, and you still can have one thing that goes against you and you lose your asylum case. My name is Bill Kovach and I am a trained immigration attorney. My goal in making these videos is to explain immigration decisions from federal courts or from the Board of Immigration Appeals and basically give you an idea of how immigration law works. Now bear in mind that while I'm an attorney, this is not meant to be legal advice. This is meant to be for informational purposes only. So today's case comes from the Fifth Circuit and so you understand the U.S. Courts of Appeals are divided into 13 circuits, 12 of which are based on geography. So the Fifth Circuit covers cases that come out of Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi. And today's case is Gino Yatani versus William Barr. It's dated July 31st, 2020. Just so you understand, William Barr is the Attorney General of the United States. He heads the Justice Department and in this case, he's being sued in his capacity as the Attorney General because it was the Department of Justice that made this asylum decision. And I apologize in advance for mispronouncing names. So let's get right into the facts of this case. Gino Yatani, an Albanian citizen, seeks asylum on the ground that members of his country's Socialist Party threatened to kill him three times and physically attacked him on one of those occasions due to his support for the Albanian Democratic Party. So right away, we know that what we have here is a case based on political opinion. So let me take a step back and briefly explain what asylum is. What are we trying to do here? Asylum is protection that we give to people from their home country, people who believe that they're in danger and we allow them to stay in the United States for their safety. We grant asylum to people because they have reasonable fear of persecution that's based on one of five protected grounds. And those protected grounds are race, religion, nationality, political opinion, and membership in a particular social group. So these are the things that everybody who files an asylum case has to prove. So getting back to the case, what they did to him is repugnant. And as you can see there, the court is already giving us an indication that they don't agree with what happened to poor Mr. Yatani. But we'll see, that's not enough. No person should have to endure what he suffered, but that does not entitle him to asylum under our laws. Our nation's immigration policy is determined by the political branches, not the courts. Now that's an interesting thing you're throwing in early in the opinion here, this idea that this is a political decision. We'll get to that when we get to the end of the case. The court continues. Congress has made clear that asylum is reserved for people who are the specific targets of persecution. That means a systemic, sustained pattern of assaults or other acts of oppression, not individual or even a handful of assaults or threats. So the court here is explaining what it takes to show persecution. And this is one of the most difficult parts of an asylum case, trying to show that either you've suffered persecution or you believe that you're going to suffer persecution because persecution's not really defined in the law. Continuing on. Furthermore, Congress has vested broad discretion in the executive branch to make asylum determinations and instructed courts to give significant deference to executive decisions. So here I think it's useful to take a break and to explain how you apply for asylum and why we're talking about executive branch decisions. So there are two ways that you can apply for asylum in the United States. The first is an affirmative application. This is somebody who is in the United States and they believe that they will face persecution if they return to home. So they file an application with USCIS, the US Citizenship and Immigration Service. So the asylum office, which is part of USCIS, makes the decision and if it turns out that the asylum office doesn't believe that the person is entitled to asylum, 
uh, then the case can be transferred to the immigration courts. And this brings us to the second way that a person can apply for asylum, and that's through a defensive application. So what is a defensive application? That's when you're already in removal. When you're in removal, you bring up asylum as a defense why the United States government should not remove you from the United States. You make this application with the immigration courts. And there's some confusion here. Even though they are courts, and even though when you go into the immigration court, you treat it as if you're before a judge. You give the judge deference, you treat him with respect. But technically, these courts are actually part of the executive branch. They're called administrative law courts. So the immigration courts are actually part of the Department of Justice. It's called the Executive Office of Immigration Review, or the EOIR. The EOIR not only has the immigration courts, but it also has a body called the Board of Immigration Appeals. And the Board of Immigration Appeals is the first body that hears an appeal from the immigration judge on whether or not their decision in a removal case was correct. Either the respondent or the immigrant in the case can file an appeal to the Board of Immigration Appeals or the BIA, or the government can if they lost the case. So here we're dealing with the respondent, the immigrant, who has filed an appeal because the Board of Immigration Appeals has given them a decision that they don't like. So let's go further. The deference is required here. Yatani suffered three threats and one attack during a short period of time. Had those incidents continued, he might very well have stated a case of persecution. But he experienced no further threats or attacks for the following six months before he decided to leave Albania. And that fact that he waited six months to leave Albania is going to be a fact that's important later on in the court's analysis. Based on the record before them, both the immigration judge and the Board of Immigration Appeals concluded that these facts did not amount to persecution. Our precedents leave us no choice but to defer to that executive branch determination. Accordingly, we deny the petition for review in part and dismiss the petition in part. So again, just a little bit of explanation there. When you're filing an appeal to a federal court from the Board of Immigration Appeals, the job of the federal court is actually somewhat limited. They can't make findings of fact, for example, and that's one place where the deference comes in. They need to defer to the facts that were found by the immigration judge, but they do get to determine issues of law. But even the issues of law are a little tricky. Where you have a topic like immigration law, you may have a part of the law that's a little bit ambiguous, meaning it can have more than one definition. And where that happens, the executive agency gets the first shot at interpreting that language and determining what the policy will be. And in those situations, while the circuit court certainly does have the ability to review the law, where the executive branch is reviewing something that is vague or ambiguous, then the courts will defer to their interpretation of the law so long as it's reasonable. So getting back to the opinion. Yatani is an Albanian national and a supporter of the Albanian Democratic Party. While in Albania, he was, according to his testimony, threatened three times and assaulted once on account of his political beliefs by members of the rival Socialist Party. So now the court is going to go through in more detail what happened to Mr. Yatani. The first time he was threatened, on June 15, 2017, Yatani and his friends were publicly carrying flags for the Democratic Party when they encountered members of the Socialist Party. The Socialist contingent confiscated their flags and threatened to kill Yatani if he carried Democratic Party flags again. Yatani attempted to file a report with the police, but was rebuffed. Now this brings up a very important point with immigration law, and that is you need more than just your testimony. It's built into the law that you also need corroboration. This means evidence that shows that what you're testifying to is more likely true. There are things like police reports, medical reports, testimony from other witnesses, maybe newspaper reports that talk about the incident that you're testifying about. And the significance of not being able to file a report for the police means that 
this evidence, this corroborating evidence, was not reasonably available to him. Three days later, Yutani was at home with his family when Socialist Party members came canvassing for votes. Upon learning that Yatani and his family supported the Democratic Party, the Socialist Party members attacked Yatani and his father. Yatani suffered injuries to his left knee and toe. According to Yatani, four men assaulted him and his father using a belt and a sharp metal object. Socialist Party members said that they would kill Yatani if he did not vote as directed. Yatani went to the hospital, received stitches, and was discharged that day. He was not prescribed any pain medication. And there comes the point for corroborating evidence again. Now that we know that Yatani went to the hospital, one of the things that Yatani needs to do is make sure that he has whatever medical reports may be available so he can present that to the immigration court as well. Continuing on. A week later, on election day in Albania, Yatani and his family were traveling to vote. They were confronted by Socialist Party members who demanded that they vote for the Socialists or face death. And a threat of death is a big deal. It can, in and of itself, be considered persecution, depending on the judge that you're talking to. Six months later, on December 20th, 2017, Yatani left Albania. He filed an application for asylum, withholding of removal, and relief under the Convention Against Torture. Withholding of removal and the Convention Against Torture are just two other forms of relief that are similar to asylum, but with asylum it's possible to eventually gain permanent residency and even citizenship, so with the other two forms of relief, that's not possible. Yatani explained that he feared he would be persecuted, beaten, and killed because of his political opinions if he returned to Albania. So there, you see that he's making a claim of a reasonable fear of persecution based on political opinion. So now we're going to skip ahead and get to more of the court's legal analysis. So even those subject to brutal physical attack are not necessarily victims of persecution. Courts have condemned all manner of egregious and even violent behavior while concluding that they do not amount to persecution. So now the court is going to give us an example of a time where they did find persecution in order to contrast with what Yatani has claimed. When we do have evidence of regular and methodical targeting, by contrast, we have not hesitated to find persecution. Now it seems that the court here is sort of being apologetic. Yes, we know something happened here was really bad, but nonetheless we can't find that it's persecution, and now they're giving us the reason why. Take Tamara Gomez versus Gonzalez. Henry Tamara Gomez was a Colombian helicopter mechanic who accompanied a team of Colombian National Police, CNP, officers on a retrieval mission to recover the bodies of fallen CNP comrades killed in a remote jungle village by terrorists in the Fuerza Armadas Revolucionarias de Colombia, FARC. Soon after the mission concluded, Tamara Gomez began receiving death threats against his family. The calls went to his cell phone and then spread to his home phone. Fearing for his family's safety, Tamara Gomez uprooted his wife and children and moved them away. Within weeks, the calls began again at his new house, now accompanied by demands for money. Soon, a bicycle bomb detonated in his family's new neighborhood, killing five civilians. And all the while, Fark was systematically hunting down and executing Tamara Gomez's retrieval team members and their families. That is prototypical persecution. The refugee faced an organized, relentless campaign of intimidation, extortion, and murder. Yatani's treatment at the hands of the Socialist Party members cannot be said to be the same. The three occasions on which he was threatened, one of which resulted in physical injury, did not necessarily reflect the kind of pattern of sustained pursuit that persecution requires. Instead, the IJ concluded that these acts were one-off incidents related to the one-time event of the Albanian election and unlikely to recur. And what's interesting is that this is a matter of degree, because some immigration judges will find that a single incident is enough to call it persecution depending on how bad the incident is. 
So let's get back to the court's opinion. I think what you'll see now is the fact I mentioned earlier that Yatani stayed in Albania for six months becomes more relevant to the Fifth Circuit. Lastly, we have often take note of when, as here, an alien has endured a threat or assault, but has nevertheless chosen to stay in his home country for a period of time, because the choice to stay tends to weaken the claim of persecution. And just as I said, the fact that Yatani stayed for six months is a key factor in determining whether this conduct was bad enough to call it persecution. Yatani remained in Albania until December 20, 2017. He offered no explanation as to why he elected to stay in Albania for almost half a year after the last instance of threatening behavior, or how he was persecuted when no further incidents or attacks took place during that time. So it's not enough simply that these bad things happen to you. There has to be this ongoing danger that you face if you remain in the country. And if you stay in the country long enough, it can negate all the bad things that happened to you up until this point. We conclude that the BIA did not err in finding that Yatani's injuries did not amount to past persecution. So again, this is an appeal from the Board of Immigration Appeals, and we see that the Fifth Circuit found nothing wrong in the Board of Immigration Appeals decision. So now we'll get to the court's conclusion where it brings up this political question again. Our decision today does not diminish the injury that Yatani and many other foreign nationals too often suffer in their home countries simply for holding unpopular political beliefs. So again, we have this apologetic language from the Fifth Circuit that even though they sympathize with what Yatani has gone through, they're still not going to find that this was good enough for asylum. Perhaps it is little surprise then that so many of them seek refuge in America, a country built on the idea that political disagreements are to be celebrated rather than repressed. Because we're in Texas, now we're going to throw a little American jingoism while we're at it. But how our nation deals with refugees is a political decision for the political branches to make, and Congress has gone out of its way to circumscribe the role of the federal courts in this area. Accordingly, we must deny the petition in part and dismiss in part. So here's where we get into that political questions, and this is where I have some major disagreements with the court. I don't see asylum so much as a political question as a legal one. The question is, did the applicant meet all of the requirements that's in law? Political questions usually come up where you have, say, a power that the Constitution specifically grants to one branch of government, usually Congress or the President. The President is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, for example, and the courts are not going to question his decisions to deploy troops across the globe. But I don't see how that is relevant to a question of asylum law, where we've got a respondent who's made an application, and really the question is, did he meet the requirements in order to grant asylum? Plus, it's not like asylum is really a political question in the sense of, we're not going to question it if it contradicts with our foreign policy. The United States grants asylum to people who are seeking protection from countries that are our allies all the time. The United States has granted people asylum from Israel, for example, or believe it or not, Pakistan is one of America's allies. It's an ally that we have against the war on terrorism. And we grant asylum to people who have problems with Pakistan all the time. So it's not like asylum is a matter of foreign policy, and for that reason I don't see it as a political question. This is where I have a major disagreement with the Fifth Circuit's analysis. Okay, so now it's your turn. Did you like what we did here? If you did, give us a thumbs up. Do you have any questions? If so, please leave them in the comments. And while you're at it, if you're in the comments, let us know if there are any topics or if there are any decisions, whether it's an executive branch decision or a court decision. Let us know if there's any particular decisions that maybe you would like us to explain in the future. Thank you. Thank you for watching. Please remember to like and subscribe. If there are any topics you would like me to address in the future, please let me know in the comments below. 
Now, I don't like talking about this, but I am currently disabled because of complications following cancer surgery. If you're feeling generous, I'll have a link to my PayPal account in the description below. Thank you.